this morning. That's our desire, that we uh, lift up the name of Jesus, lift up the name of our Lord and worship Him, because He serves and is a good, good Father, or Father is, who, uh, uh, who we belong to and whom we love and serve. So let's sing that together. Good, good Father. Yeah. 
compel the power of Jesus' name that angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Let's sing it together. All hail the power of Jesus' name. again. Uh, we are in our first, our reading this morning again is from 1 Samuel. Uh, remember last week that we talked about uh, 1 Samuel, first chapter, and we were talking about uh, Hannah and Eli, Hannah praying to the Lord for a child. <clears throat> she was barren. So we're in this morning, um, 1 Samuel chapter 2, and we'll start at verse 12 and go through, I believe it's 18. <clears throat> now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. And the custom of the priests were the people. When any man was offering a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand. Then he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. Thus they did in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Also, before they burned the fat, the priest's servant would come and say, 
to the man who was sacrificing, Give the priest meat for roasting, as he will not take boiled meat from you, only raw. If the man said to him, They must surely burn the fat first, and then take as much as you desire, then he would say, No, but you shall give it to me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Thus the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for the men despised the offering of the Lord. Uh, let's remember our giving. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for your uh, honoring the Lord in this way. Uh, we read in Hannah's, in Hannah's uh, prayer to the Lord and her rejoicing when, when, uh, he was, when she was given the child, um, Samuel, that, that, you know, she says, there is none like God, there is none like him. And uh, this thing about worship and uh, how we are to worship. You know, in the New Testament, we're called to be a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable, to set your mind on the things of God and to renew your mind. So this is where we are this morning. We are here to remember God and to honor him in what we do and say and uh, so that he, he may be highly esteemed and he may be honored in this place and in our lives. So let's remember our giving to the Lord as first priority, uh, what we do. Um, thank you for your giving to Mountain View, remembering the Lord in that way. Um, we thank you for being here and being ready to worship. Let's go to worship and by prayer. Father in heaven, you are good, you are faithful, you are God above all gods, and uh, you are sovereign Lord of our lives, and we need to recognize that, that we are your people, the sheep of your pasture. We are not created by ourselves. You created us in all things that we see and all things unseen. Uh, let us humble, our, humble ourselves before you and remember to give you thanks and praise and honor in all that we do and say. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
time and um, we'll remember some of our people who are, are sick and, and I'm thinking specifically right now of uh, Martha LeBron's uh, sister we've been praying for her sister who lives in New Jersey and um, uh, her sister when we started live streaming the me- uh, the service her sister started watching and she watched every, watched every uh, service that we'd had in fact, Martha would talk to her about the, the service afterwards. Uh, but she's in a coma. Her Martha's sister is. Debbie is her name, and uh, things are not looking very well. Her husband's dying of pancreatic cancer at the same time, so uh, the, uh, she, they have two boys. And um, Debbie has trusted the Lord, no doubt, not sure about her husband or her son. So we want to pray for that family. Of course, pray for some of our people, uh, we want to praise God for the good report that that uh, our, our dear one here um, received, the Montgomerys. Uh, we're so thankful for the good report they've received here. And um, again, we want to keep praying for those who are hurting, who are um, in great pain at this time, some emotional pain. So again, we just uh, uh, want to keep you know praying for one another. So let's... Uh, Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for your grace, your love. Thank you for the fact that you are a good, good God. And Lord, I pray today for, especially for um, Martha's sister, uh, Debbie. Lord, we're praying for a miracle there, no doubt. Um, but we're thankful that she's come to know you. We pray for her husband and her boys that they too might come to know you as well. Father, we know there are those in our church who have chronic pain and it's with them every day. We pray for, for healing, Lord, that you may comfort them and touch them. We also know, Lord, that uh, in our church and those who perhaps are watching online, um, uh, even outside of our church, uh, that they are struggling with perhaps emotional pain. We pray for them as well. And Lord, we just again thank you for your word, the power of your word in our lives. And uh, every Sunday we open the, the word of God in I confess that we take that for granted, uh, how pro- privileged we are to be able to open your word to uh, 
hear the different things that the Spirit of God will say to each of us. Um, and so, Father, we pray today that we might be able to put aside the things of this past week that might distract us and that our focus might be one of just an open heart. Lord, fill us. May our heart be one of total surrender. God, I give my life to you, regardless of what that means. And so, Lord, again, we are desperately dependent upon the Spirit of God uh, during this hour to communicate your truth to our individual needs, Lord, but also that we might understand what it means to be a man or one of, of God, and especially to be one that God blesses and uses significantly. So we pray this in the, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Just want to say that uh, for those who uh, haven't read the bulletin or haven't seen the notice, the reason you don't see the data projectors working is that we, we were hit by lightning a few weeks ago. And uh, as I wrote to the congregation uh, a couple of weeks ago, that we are uh, in the process of determining what we're going to do to replace what we have. We, there's, technology has come so far, and so uh, I think they've decided this week, the deacons have decided uh, what we're going to do, and it's going to take a few weeks to get that uh, brought about, but uh, anyway, we will be back with a form of something that's going to be a little bit different than what you're looking at right now, but uh, it's going to be really nice. So, Well, I, uh, I love Roman numerals. I, I just kind of I've always loved Roman numerals, and, and so I, I love watches that have Roman numerals. The watch I have on right now has Roman numerals. I've got two watches. I've got a few watches I, I wear, and, but there are a couple of them that I have, uh, one with a brown band, one with a black band that have Roman numerals. Now, what if, though, you had, um, you're in a meeting with me, and uh, We've got a whole group of people in this meeting, and uh, someone says, well, Byron, what, what time is it? And I say, um, I don't know. I said, well, you, you've got a watch band on your arm. You don't have a watch? Well, yeah, i got a watch. But it's, it doesn't work. Uh, I, I just like Roman numerals, and this watch is Roman numeral, has Roman numerals on it, and so I, it's actually quit working about last year, but I, I'm still wearing because I like Roman numerals. Now, what are you going to say to me? You're going to say, <laughs> well, maybe I shouldn't repeat what you might say, I think, but, um, but you're going to think, <laughs> don't, uh, say maybe, you, you, don't you think you ought to go get a, a new one? I mean, the purpose of your watch is to tell the time. If you don't have a watch that tells the time, what do you do? You go get another one. If it breaks, if a cell phone breaks, you don't carry it around, you you go and, and get another one. Well, you know, um, that's what God does with us as well. God, you see, has purchased us with his blood, and he's purchased us with his blood so that we might serve a purpose in this world for him. He wants us to make a difference in the area, the sphere of our influence, whatever that might be, whoever that might be mainly and first, of course, with our families, but cer certainly beyond our families. But God desires to, to do, desires that we, you know, be used of him. And what we see and what we're going to see today is that when we are not, God will choose to replace us. He will choose to say, okay, you've had your chance, now I'm going to replace you. I, I, in our passage today, as we continue in this new series on, on um, uh, 1 Samuel f you know, 1 through 15, uh, uh, so Samuel and Saul, we see Eli, the priest, who, of whom God had chosen and to be effective for him to, have the, to make a difference in the nation of Israel and certainly in his own family, and he, did, he, he didn't do that. He chose not to do that that and because of that God says because you have failed 
I'm going to replace you. And they're going to put somebody else whose heart is right with me. And that's our text today is really is that God is speaking to Eli and he's going to show us the kind of person that he chooses to bless and he chooses to use. Um, and, and, and we're going to go to 1 Samuel in just a moment, but, but before we go there, I want us to go to Matthew chapter 5, beginning verse 13. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. In Matthew 5, verse 13... Give you a second to get there. In verse 13, it says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a, a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Now, verse 16. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. We've seen this verse, if you've graduated from Sunday school, you've seen this verse or these verses many times that tells us that we are to be the salt of the earth, we are to be the light of the world, we are to be like a city on a hill. Um, to translate that into our everyday vernacular, it means that God has placed us into our, again, world of influence to make a difference. And it begins in the home. No doubt. We're going to have a couple of weeks we'll be speaking on fathers. Uh, but this applies also to fathers and to mothers. You know, when salt loses its taste, it's kind of bad, isn't it? I mean, you can't ignore uh, salt, you can't ignore light. I've told you that I'm on a, a low sodium diet, one that I put myself on. Uh, and you know what? I check everything I, I eat, uh, what's in every, everything I eat, and uh, s concerning the sodium primarily, some, some of the other stuff, I guess, but particularly the sodium. And you know, I eat stuff at home without salt or with, let's say, low salt. But you know, it's hard. It's really hard. Salt, without salt, it's tasteless, right? Well, our lives, without being the salt of the earth that God has called us to be, is tasteless. It's of no use. Well, in our passage today, we learned about the type of person who is salt and light that God not only blesses, but God uses. And additionally, we see that God will replace the one who loses his saltiness, who loses his brightness, his light. So let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Samuel's in the, 1 Samuel's in the Old Testament after the book of Ruth. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, as we saw last week, we saw that, uh, that divine disappointment often can, uh, has to do with a bigger picture. We, we told the story, we've heard the story about Hannah and her prayer to, to, that God would give her a, a, a child. She was barren. But as I pointed out last week, so often preachers, and I've been guilty of this as well, they preach on that context, but they don't give the bigger picture. Hannah's divine disappointment was all about Samuel's divine destiny. God had a divine destiny for Samuel, but Hannah had to go through some di uh, divine disappointment in order for Samuel to get to where he needed to get. Uh, the book of 1 Samuel really is a fascinating snapshot of a very critical time in the history of God's people. It was a time when Israel was impatiently asking for a physical king. They said, we want a king just like everyone else. A lot like teenagers who say, uh, we want a, um, why can't I be like 
so-and-so. His parents allow him to do stupid stuff. Well, that's not what they say, but that's kind of what they mean, right? So uh, that's kind of the idea here. They said, why can't we have a king like everybody else? We don't have a king. Everybody else, all the other countries have a king. Well, God had a perfect king in mind, but the time was not yet fulfilled, as Galatians 4 points out. But before God agreed to allow his people to enthrone an imperfect prototype of his future king, God set out firmly to establish an office of men who would coexist with this monarchy and boldly speak on behalf of God. That's where our story begins, 1100 B.C., Uh, God orchestrates the events that led to the birth and the temple adoption of, say it, Samuel, right? He was the first in a long line of prophets like Nathan, Amos, Hosea, Joel, Michael, Isaiah, uh, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, and Jeremiah. All who were going to be used for God... In this, along with these kings who were going to speak to Israel, while Israel has these secular kings, these prophets were ordained by God. In fact, again, God in his omniscience knew that uh, Israel was going to ask for a king. And so he knew that he had to have prophets to speak, to be that, what I would call that God consciousness to the nation of Israel during the time of these kings. In fact, uh, Samuel was like John the Baptist. He really was a John the Baptist to the prophets who, who were to come. You remember, uh, John the Baptist was the one who was a forerunner of Christ, and he basically was a time who said, we're, we're done with the Mosaic age, we're done with that, now we're going into an age of grace. Christ is coming. Well, Samuel who, by the way, was the the greatest king that, uh, excuse me, greatest judge that Israel had in the four, you know, decades or so that, uh, centuries, I should say, that, uh, you know, Israel had these uh, judges. But he is the one who brings that era of the judges to an end, and he is a forerunner of these new prophets. In fact, if you look in chapter 3, verse 1, it says that visions basically new truth, new revelation from God were were seldom heard up to this point. We kind of get the idea when we read the Old Testament that that God was always speaking. Not so. There are basically three periods in all of the history of of Christendom or, you know, of the Bible in which God spoke profusely. And so Samuel is the first one of these prophets who will speak on behalf of God during this time when Israel wanted these kings. Now, as you turn to 1 Samuel, look at verse 12 of chapter 2. Verse 12 of chapter 2. It says, Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. (laughs) That's a mouthful, right? The word worthless, um, in fact, the text here is a son, is literally the sons of Belial, which means worthless. It's a word for Satan, but it means worthless, it means wickedness, it means evil. They were wicked men. In fact, it's interesting in the Septuagint, and, and you're going to hear me talk about the Septuagint, so let me just answer when you ask the question what is the Septuagint? The Septuagint, again, was, a, was the, the Greek, Koine Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. During the first century, actually about 283 B.C., they began to translate the Old Testament into the Greek te- text. Why? Because most of the people during that day of the known world spoke Greek, not Hebrew. And so people, the, the 70 Jews got together, scholars got together and said, we, we need to translate the Old Testament, Hebrew Old Testament, into Greek, okay? And so that's what they did. And so uh, a lot of times when you read a quote and you'll see something in your, in your New Testament and it'll say, it'll say reference a, a particular passage, 
And, and you know it's a quote. You know that it's a reference to a quote out of the Old Testament. But if you go back and look at that, that quote, I mean, and tr- compare the verse with the actual passage in the Old Testament, you'll say they don't, you'll, sometimes you'll say, well, these don't really match up completely. Why is that? Probably in many cases it's because the author, and, and it w- could be Jesus, could be Paul, could be Peter, John, uh, but many times it's because they're quoting out of not the Hebrew text of the Old Testament, but the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Now, I'm going to be referencing it, the, the Septuagint throughout the, the, uh, this series. You say, why? Because words that are sometimes in the Hebrew are very elastic. They can mean many things. You're going to see that in just a moment. But in the Greek, the Greek is much more precise. In the, uh, in the Hebrew language, uh, there are about 10,000 words. In the, in the Greek language, about 200,000 words. Very precise. Uh, that's why God gave that language for the New Testament to be written in. So, uh, so if you go back to the, the Septuagint, this word that's used here is the word lomas, which means pestilence. In Acts 24, verse 5, it speaks of someone, it says, For we have found this man a real pest. There's the word. A fellow who stirs up dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, a ringleader of the sect of the Nazareneness. Of the Nazarenes, I should say. Excuse me. These guys were like a cancer in Israel at the time. Secondly, and, and by the way, we're going to see that throughout this about what that cancer did to the people of Israel. But secondly, the thing we see here is he said they did not know the Lord. Now, again, here's the word know. And the word know in the Hebrew is yada. Now, it's a word that's used in, in many different ways. In fact, one way that it's used is in the context of a, of a man and woman, husband and wife, knowing each other intimately. You know what I'm talking about. Now, the problem with some people who, who don't understand, and they grab, they go back to strong concordance, and they grab a word out of the back of the Hebrew, and they say, well, that word gives a meaning of the Hebrew words, and they say, well, it means this. This word does not also, does not always, I should say, mean intimacy. The word is used over 800 times in the Hebrew Old Testament. So it doesn't always mean that. But, in, again, in the Septuagint, it's the Greek word oida. And you may remember there are three Greek words for, or, for knowledge. One is gnosis, one's epinosis, and one's oida. oida. Oida is full knowledge. And so here it says, they didn't know God. Uh, in fact, in, in, in the Build, we're being a little technical here, but it's going to get very practical in a moment. Uh, the literal Hebrew here, or the Greek here in this passage, in the Septuagint, is, is an aorist participle, which means this. Here's how I would translate. This is my translation. Having not fully known the Lord, they were wicked men. Now, the word oida means full knowledge. So he says, having not fully known the Lord, oida again speaks of complete knowledge, uh, experiential knowledge that's combined with intellectual knowledge. They didn't have that. And he says, because they were wicked, they didn't have that. So I assume this, that they were not believers at all. They were religious people, but their hearts were not right with God. Now, let's pick it up in verse 13. It says, in the custom of the priest uh, with the people, when any man was offering a sacrifice, the priest servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand. Then he would thrust it into the pan and kettle. Now, he's ta- they're talking about the sacrifices that the people would bring, if you follow me here. And he, he says, um, they, they would, uh, then he would thrust it into the pan or the kettle or the cauldron or the pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. Thus they did in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came 
there. Now in verse 15, it says, And before they burned the fat, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give the priest meat for roasting, as he will not take boiled meat from you, only raw. Three things that they did here that they were guilty of, they're charged with. This is, again, this is the sons of Eli, who are priests, are serving as priests in the tabernacle. And they were ungodly people. Again, their hearts were not right with God. But here's what, three things they said they did. Number one, they robbed the people of their share of the peace offering. Not being satisfied with just the breast and the thigh. Now, keep in mind. Normally, when they would come for sacrifices, when they bring their meat to be sacrificed, normally they would cut out the fat, and the fat would be burned. And then the meat that's left over would be divided between the priest and those who brought the sacrifice. Now, the priests were allowed two parts of that sacrifice, the breast and the thigh. Not so with Eli's, Eli's sons. He's, they wanted it all. We want all of it. Secondly, they demanded meat before the fat had been offered to God, thus shirking the law, the law of, of Moses. And thirdly, they wanted to roast the meat instead of boiling it, putting their own carnal appetites. They wanted prime rib. They wanted it that, their, their way. Now, there's one other sin that they were known for. It's found in verses 22 to 25. So skip over to verse uh, 22, and uh, follow me there. It says, Now Eli was very old, and he w- heard all that his sons were doing to all Israel, and how they lay with the women who served at the doorway of the tent of the meeting. And he said to them, Why do you do such things, the evil things that I hear from all these people? No, my sons, for the report is not good which I hear the Lord's people circulating. If one man sins against another, God will mediate for him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? Now, please watch what what Eli is saying. Everything he says incriminates himself. Hmm. But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for the Lord desired to put them to death. Harsh words, tough words that are spoken here. These men, these two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were not only cheating the people from their food, the meat and so forth, but they were also involved in fornication. Now that's bad on two fronts. Number one, it's bad on the fact that these ladies who had volunteered to serve at the tabernacle Uh, were being abused. They were abusing their authority as a priest. And secondly, of course, the worst was the fornication in which they were involved. And thus, they're supposed to be priests who stand before people who have pure hearts and who deliver the goods of God, so to speak. And yet, their hearts are far from that. So what kind of person does God love to bless and use? And we learned this from Eli in, in, in kind of a, in, in a, in a reverse way, I, I guess you could say. Number one, the type of person that God blesses and uses is one that is not willing to compromise. He's not willing to compromise. Let your eyes flip back to verse 12 in this same chapter. It says, here it says, the sons of Eli were worthless men. It does not say Hophni or Phinehas. God holds Eli responsible for the dealings of his sons. Interesting enough. In fact, the little Hebrew, I, I've shared with you my translation, but you could translate this passage another way in the Hebrew. And that is, you could say the sons of Eli were the sons of evil. Pointing, of course, the word that's used there is the word that's used with, um, with Satan. Have you ever had an unexpected guest knock on the door and uh, you see them before they get to the door and what happens? 
you start throwing stuff in closets, and uh, it's not the type of person, maybe it's a guest or a friend, close friend, or somebody uh, that you can't tell to leave because your house is not presentable. So you start throwing stuff in the closet, start kicking things out of sight. Hmm. Well, it's, isn't it interesting how we get used to the mess in our house when, uh, and then somebody comes and then we're aware, made aware of the mess in our house? Well, Eli had a mess in his house and he had gotten used to it. He'd gotten used to the unrighteousness the sin of his sons. In fact, he was a part of it that we'll see in just a moment. What we see here is that God is going, rep- going to replace a compromising person with a non-compromising person. That's what the text screams. This is what God does. He takes the compromising one and he says, listen, I've given you a chance to serve me. I've given you a chance to be blessed by me. But because you won't do, you will live a, you're living this life of compromise. I'm going to replace you. I'm done. Strong words, right? Uh, and look back at verse 29. It says, uh, the first part says, why do you kick at the, my sacrifice? And we're not going to look at the first part right now. But it says, and you honor your sons above me. But, but now watch the latter part of that verse. By making yourselves fat with the choicest of every offering of my people. What was Eli doing? Eli is saying to his sons, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be treating people that way. By the way, you got, you say, you got any prime rib today? See, he was participating in the compromise. God blesses those and uses those who want to make a difference in their world and who are willing to stand up to wrong. Watch this. Even if it's in your own family. He was not willing to stand up to his sons. God's people in the Bible are often told of the danger of compromise. Numbers 33, 55 says, but if you do not drive out the inhabitants, God was speaking to Israel about the the compromise with the Canaanites. He says, if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come about that those whom you let remain of them will become as pricks in your eyes and as thorns in your sides and they will trouble you in the land in which you live. By the way, parents, and if you have young children, if you let your children get away with it now, you'll you'll pay for it later on. Often we can compromise like Eli in order not to offend, not to be rejected when it comes to unrighteousness and wrong behavior in our own family. There, there are times that you have to speak the truth. If you're going to be God's man or God's woman in that family or in that neighborhood or at that school or wherever or with those friends, if you're going to be God's person there, that you, one that God's going to bless, then there are times that you have to speak up and say, this is wrong. Not arrogant, not belligerent. My wife, who teaches at Kennesaw State, has told me on numerous occasions when she would, was there driving in. Now she teaches online. But she'd tell me, they said, today the preachers were back. Now what did that mean? Well, there's a square there in, at Kennesaw State, and there would be these young guys who were preachers, and they stand in the square, and they start preaching, and it's hellfire and brimstone, and telling the people, that they're going to hell. And one time, or more than once, I think she pulled them aside and said, you guys are doing more bad than good. There's no grace, there's no love in your, in your message. Hmm. They don't, of course, they don't listen. Hmm. Eli needed to do the same with his sons. He needed to remove them from what they were doing. He needed to say to them, this has to change. If it doesn't change, if you don't repent, if your life doesn't change, I'm sorry, son, I love you. I love both of you, but you're going to have to, you're done. You're done. 
and the chips fall where they may. Frederick Hanley Page was a, a pioneer in aviation. This is an interesting article. Uh, years ago, he was flying across Arabia one day, and um, he heard a, a gnawing sound in, in, in his airplane. And of course, he was by himself flying solo. Uh, and so, unknown to him, uh, because of the food, the attraction to the food, the, a rat had gotten involved in the cargo, gotten into the cargo of the airplane, and thus was there. And so, he hears this gnawing. And again, this is many years ago, and so he's thinking... He, re he knows what a rat can do to the vital lines in an airplane. And so he said, he said his heart began to pound. And then he thought, he remembers something he had learned years ago in school. Sometimes that stuff you learn way back comes back to your mind, right? He said he remembered reading or hearing that rats can't live in high elevation. They can't breathe. And so he began to climb. And, uh, and sure enough, the gnawing, this gnawing that he heard, uh, ceased. When he got to, to the ground and they landed, they found a dead rat right behind the cockpit. Hmm. Folks, there are things in our lives, there are things around us, and the propensity is to go low and to say, ah, I don't want to do that. I don't want to cause any harm. I don't want to cause any conflict. I don't want to alienate. I don't want to be rejected. That's a cry of the world today. But the answer is not to go low, but go high. Say, hey, I can't. I love you. But God is first in my life, and I have to live for him. Whatever that means. Now, I want you to notice, we're going to go back to verses 18 through 21. I want you to notice what happens here. We know that Hannah gave Samuel to the tabernacle, to Eli, to become a prophet and a priest. Now, Samuel, verse 18 says, And Samuel was ministering before the Lord as a boy wearing a linen ephod. And his mother would make him a little robe and bring it to him from year to year when she would come up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless uh, Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you children from this woman in place of the one she dedicated to the Lord. And they went to their own home. The Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew before the Lord. Now there are several things you see here. First thing you see is that God paid back Hannah, fivefold for the sacrifice she made. Now, there are scholars who believe that these children didn't come until five years later. So if that's true, then there's a good lesson in all, to all of us about how we have to wait for God to bless us. He's not going to bless us right now. But what we see here is this mother who had already sacrificed her son to the service of the Lord in the tabernacle all of his days. But now she comes each year for the yearly sacrifice, the festivals and so forth. But also she's coming, she's got her son in mind. He's never out of her mind and she comes with this ephod. Ephod is, was this little uh, robe, uh, liturgical robe that they would wear that would come down to their waist, a priest and so forth. Of course, there probably weren't any T3 or T5 uh, ephods hanging in the tabernacle. So she, he's a growing boy. She's got to make them each year. She's making them, you know, as he grows up. But her mind, her heart is on, on her son. But think about that for a moment. But not just the sacrifice she made, but think about every time as a mother she walked away from the tabernacle, how gut-wrenching, heart-wrenching that had to be for her the sacrifice she had made, that she's leaving her son. We get upset when we take our son off to college and we leave him there and we, oh, our hearts are broken. She gave him this child who was probably three years of age when he was given to the tabernacle. Eli 
was not willing to sacrifice even a strained relationship with his sons. Hmm. So what happens? A man of God comes to Eli for the purpose of confronting him and points out his sin. But before he does, he begins with all the benefits that God has provided for him and for Israel. Let's pick it up in verse 27. Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I not indeed reveal myself in the, uh, to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in bondage to Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose them? from all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, to carry an ephod before me? And did I not give the house of your father's, uh, house of your father, all the fire offerings of the sons of Israel? Uh, three things he points out. Before he confronts Eli, he talks about what God, what God had already done. Sometimes we're not salty in our homes or around in our neighborhood or at our work because we forget what God has done for us. Sometimes we're unwilling to sacrifice for the kingdom of God because we have forgotten what God has done for us. One of the things we talk about here is positional truth, understanding who you are in Christ understanding that he has blessed you with every spiritual blessing. He's given you an eternity. There's a day coming when you will come back, we believers will come back with Christ and reign here on this earth. It's there. Jesus said it was true, and Jesus rose from the dead, and so I'm going with the guy who rose from the dead. I'm going to believe his word. And yet we forget, and we think that by standing up for Christ at work, that that's too, or in our neighborhood or with our friends, we think that's, that's too big of a sacrifice. Uh, I, I don't, I don't want to alienate people from me. I don't want to be rejected. Hmm. This generation of Christians living today should be the most motivated, the most radical army for God to ever live. I mean, we had a missionary today, I mean, not today, but uh, oh, a year or two ago, who came and said, in, in each village or each church, each church has one Bible. That's it. One Bible. Man, we're inundated with tools. We're literate. We can read. And yet we think standing up for Christ is too much much of a sacrifice. I might use my, lose my job. I might, I might alienate my children and they won't come to Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas dinner or whatever it might be. God said to Eli, look, look at all I've done for you and your people and you're not willing to spank your kids. You're not willing to confront them about their sin. Really? And God says, because you're unwilling to stand up and make that sacrifice, I'm going to replace you. Look back again at verse 29. Why do you kick at my sacrifice and at my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling? And honor, now watch this, don't miss this. Honor your sons above me by making yourself fat with their choicest of every offering, etc., etc. He said, why do you compromise? Why do you, in fact, the word that's used there, the Septuagint, it's a Greek idea of continuous action. Why do you keep on compromising? Why do you keep on honoring your sons more than me? Essentially, he was saying, why do you love your sons? Why do you love your children more than me? He said, because of your loyalty to your children over God, I'm going to reject you. Do you know the person that God supports, the person that God runs to uphold, the person that God loves to bless, the person that God loves to use? It is the one who does not place their loyalty to their children or anybody else over God and his righteousness. 
Anything that promotes itself, now hear me clearly, anything that promotes itself above God is an idol. Now look, I understand, look, you know I, I love children. I love, believe as leaders you should love your children, you should disciple them, you should mentor them. But they can become an idol. Um, I heard a very good teacher, Bible teacher this week say, the idol of today, and this is like speaking against Mother Nature and apple pie, he said, the idol today is that of children. I thought that was a strong, too strong of a statement, but, but I understand. I understand where he's coming from. Uh, you ask people today, what's the most important thing in your life? My children. We used to tell our children, here's the pecking order. <laughs> it's God and your mother and your father. For me, it was a, it's God, your mother, and then you. Like, wow, that's, you don't know how, some people say, that, that's harsh. You know what? You don't know how much security that builds into them when they know that you love your spouse more than they and you are committed to that spouse. Now, some of you are going to say this is pretty harsh. Don't shoot the messenger. Let's go to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10, remember this passage a few weeks ago we we talked about this. It says, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace on earth, but, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her daughter, a mother-in-law and a, a man and a man's enemies will be the member, uh, members of his household. You get that? You read that? He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it. In other words, if you're striving to find your life, you're going to lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. You walk into a store or walk into your work, I should say, and you stand up for Christ. Essentially, what are you saying? You're saying that Christ is more important to you than the people that work, or even your job, maybe. Should that not be the same at home? If you love your children, and I say this with, with grace and love, if you love your children more than you love God, you won't be salty in their lives. You won't bring much godly light into their lives. I, um, my observation over the years, especially recently, is that I've seen adults who let their older teenagers or their young adults tell them how to think. They come back from school, they come back with a liberal slant on some things, and so somehow the parents find a way to acquiesce to their children's thoughts and so forth because they don't want to offend. I often, I'm laughing because I, I often think about what my dad would have said if I come back with some of that stuff. He said, son, sit down, we need to talk. My number one task as a father when my children were in in the home was not to be the coolest. It was not to be the most popular. It was not to be their best friend, though I tried to nurture a relationship with all of them, and I dated each one of them, and Debbie did as well. But we never sacrificed the role of a parent to be that godly light that says, this is wrong, and if this is wrong, it has to change. Here's number two, the person God blesses. 
He's willing to make sacrifices no matter the cost. Understand, I'm not saying you shouldn't be loving with your children. uh, But you never waver. You've got to be willing to make the sacrifice in standing for God's righteousness, God's truth. If it causes a strained relationship or a lost relationship, you say, I'm sorry. I love you and I'll be here for you always. But it can't be business as usual. Some will say, well, I just want to be, you know, you can dress this thing up really well, by the way. Some people say, well, I just want to be a, a peacemaker. And I don't, you know, don't want to con- have conflict in, in the home. Let's go to one more passage, Luke chapter 14. Luke 14, 26. It says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers, brothers and sisters... Yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And what's he mean by that? Are we to hate our children? Are we to hate our fathers and mothers? No. He's just saying that in comparison, when it comes to loyalty, in comparison, there can be no comparison of my loyalty to God versus my loyalty to my children or to my spouse or anyone else. There can be no comparison. Christ perhaps was making a list of those who may need to be sacrificed. And verse 30, back in 1 Samuel 2, what does God say? He says, therefore the Lord God of Israel declares, I did indeed say that your house and the house of your father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord declares, Far be it from me, for those who honor me, I will honor, I will bless. Those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. Those are kind words and gracious words. The person that God uses is a person, God blesses a person who's willing to lay it all on the line for Christ. All of it. Not in a belligerent way, not in a mean way, not in a mean-spirited way, not, not in a defensive way in a gracious way that says, hey, I love you, brother. I've told this story, but some of you have not heard it. When I left, I was a associate, during seminary, I was a part-time associate with a, in a church, um, and, the, and, and during that time, I discipled about eight men. Um, well, when I left that church, finished school, I left that church and went uh, on somewhere else, uh, but some people came to me. I was still in the area, and some people came to me, and they said, you need to... Um, Go talk to Chuck. I said, why? He said, Chuck's, he's off the deep end. He's throwing it all to the wind. Chuck had a problem with anger. And he just finally just gave up, said, I I can't keep it, my anger intact, forget it. He said, Barman, you're the only guy he'll listen to. You gotta go talk to him. Now Chuck, and his wife have been so gracious. We were young, poor, seminary students, and they had been so gracious to us. And so this was hard. This was really hard. But I talked to him. I said, Chuck, at one point I said, I'm laying our relationship on the line. You know I love you. I'd do anything for you. I said, I'm laying our relationship on the line because if you're turning and repenting and turning back to God and being fully committed to him means sacrificing this relationship, I'm willing to do that. That's what you've got to be willing to do. To make your children. The last, and we've got to touch on this quickly. In chapter 3 of First Samuel, you see the call of Samuel to the role of a prophet. We, everybody knows the story. God, Samuel gets the call. He hears somebody saying, Samuel. And Samuel jumps up. He runs to Eli. He runs down the hall and says, here I, here I am. What, 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 what's up? I, I didn't call you. Go back and go back to sleep. Go back down in your room. Here's the voice again, Samuel. And you know how it goes. You, if you graduate from Sunday school, you've heard this story many times, right? 
And so he goes finally, and Eli kind of puts two and two together and says, well, wait a minute, God is speaking to him. And he said, go back and listen to God. And here we see the, 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 the commissioning uh, of Samuel. He doesn't even say, I'm going to make you a prophet. He says, this is what I want you to tell Eli and the people of Israel. But why did he choose Samuel? Samuel's working in the tabernacle, but has he demonstrated himself worthy of this call? Look in verse 26 of chapter 2. So now the boy Samuel was growing in stature and in favor, both with the Lord and with men. In verse, uh, look at chapter 3, verse 1. It says, now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli. So we see that he was growing. In fact, it's referenced later on uh, that he was growing in the Lord as well. And so here's a guy, here's a young man at a very young age who had a heart for God. And by the way, may I say to you parents and grandparents, the most important thing you can do is get truth into the lives of your children as early as you can. So thankful for our WANA program. Jim, you led it for many years now. Boy, and we're, we appreciate you who are involved, uh, Larry and, and Janet and, and all of you. The best thing you can do is get truth into the children at an early age. That was going on in Samuel. And God says, I'm going to bless you, Samuel, because, in fact, just let your eyes drop at verse, verses 19 and 20. Um, over in chapter 3, I should say. It says, Thus Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fail. Boy, don't you want that? Don't you want God's hand on you like that? Here's the third. He was growing in the Lord and serving him. He was growing in the Lord and serving him. So that's the, this is the person that God chooses to use. He's not willing to compromise He's not, he is willing to make sacrifices no matter the cost to stand for Christ, to stand for his righteousness. righteousness. And thirdly, he's growing in the Lord and he's serving in the Lord. Some of you say, I just don't feel like I'm growing in the Lord. Think of this. Maybe you think you're not worthy. Think of an acorn. An acorn drops to the ground, gets buried in the ground. What happens to that acorn? It grows into a giant tree. God wants to do that in every one of our lives. And it doesn't matter how old you are, you never stop growing. And maybe you've hit skids at a certain age and you're kind of, you've learned how to speak the Christian ease, but the growth is not there. Grow in him. Here's the application. Two statements. Remember that God has a purpose for you to make a difference, but it requires commitment and loyalty to God above all. That's a, me that's a message every Sunday, is it not? Is it? Secondly, do not allow your children but to become your idol. Love them, disciple them, but never put them above. God first, your mate second. Let's pray. Lord, we love you, and we confess that our hearts are, at heart, we're rebels. And we're prone to put things above you that tickle our fancy, that make us feel good. Sometimes we put all of our joy in our children, not in you. Lord, teach us. I would think that all of us here would want to be candidates for your blessing and your use. So teach us. And Lord, if any of these things I've said today are not true, may they fall by the wayside. But if they are true, we know they, they are, Lord, may your spirit rivet them to the walls of our minds that we not forget. And may we not forget what you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.